There are a ton of questions out there about Easter and whether Christians should celebrate it, and here's the thing. While there are a lot of internet myths and conspiracy theories about Easter's pagan and historical origins, which we're going to address in this video, there are also some legitimate concerns we need to look at, and we don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. So we're going to take a level-headed biblical look at this holiday. And this video is intended to be a helpful resource, so we're going to cover a lot of ground, from pagan myths to Constantine to whether it's appropriate for Christians to celebrate Easter today. And to help you out, we've added chapter links, which you'll find in the description below. That way you can jump right to the topic you're most interested in if you want. Just be aware that many of these topics are interrelated. So let's start by defining our terms. Because Easter is a global holiday that can mean different things to different people, let's first clear up what Easter is before we dig into the claims and the controversies about it. And we'll start with a dictionary definition. Easter, noun, a feast that commemorates Christ's resurrection and is observed with variations of date due to different calendars on the first Sunday after the Paschal moon. So the Merriam-Webster definition of Easter is essentially the same as the Christian definition of Easter. It's a remembering and a celebration of the resurrection of Jesus. And yet, sadly, that's not what Easter means or is for many people. Not everyone who celebrates Easter believes in Jesus or, or that he was ever resurrected or even thinks about him in relation to that holiday. Now, I live in the Nashville area, which has an unusually high concentration of churches and, and professing Christians. So I went up to my local Walmart to check out their Easter display, and, and they had five aisles dedicated to this holiday. Here, here are some photos I took. And as you can see, there's baskets and candy and eggs, toys, stuffed animals, decorations, bunnies, chicks, right? However, this children's book was the only thing I saw about Jesus in all those aisles. There was nothing about the crucifixion or the resurrection or the empty tomb. And sadly, that's just the reality of the post-Christian culture that we live in. So if we're going to have a discussion about Easter, we need to first recognize that, that there are essentially two different versions of this holiday, one secular and one religious. And the majority of our discussion today will be on the religious version of Easter. I'm not going to defend the secular version, but it does bring up some challenging questions for Christians. So let's start our discussion there. To what degree, if any, should Christians participate in the secular version of Easter? I mean, all that stuff we saw in the Walmart aisle, bunnies and eggs and baskets and candy, and they have no basis in the Bible and zero connection to the resurrection of Jesus. So is it wrong for Christians to include those sorts of things in their celebration of Easter? Well, let me start by stating a simple fact that might sound surprising to some of you. Christians are under no obligation to celebrate Easter. Now, it's a global tradition that's been observed by the vast majority of believers since the second century. And personally, I think it's right and good to dedicate a day every year to remembering the most important event in the history of humanity, the resurrection of Jesus. Easter is the most gospel-focused holiday on the church calendar. However, the Bible doesn't require it of Christians. So, for believers like me who choose to celebrate Easter, I think the question should be, what is the most biblical and God-honoring way to do so? Because let's face it, whether or not we choose to celebrate Easter, or, or how we choose to celebrate it, it's not a matter of salvation. If, Ephesians 2 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works so that no one may boast. Our salvation is not a result of works. So our souls don't hang in the balance based on how we handle the Easter holiday. Therefore, if we approach this issue from the perspective of wanting to walk out our faith in a way that honors God, that shows love for Him, 
and that points the dying world around us toward the salvation that can only be found in Jesus, well then, I think we can agree on a couple things. First, it would be a grave mistake for a Christian to participate in the secular version of Easter to the exclusion of its religious meaning. If we only do Easter egg hunts and make bunny cakes and, and paint eggs and hide baskets of candy, but we're not commemorating the resurrection of Jesus, I would say that's the wrong way for a Christian to celebrate Easter. And not because those things are morally wrong in and of themselves, but because we're passing up a tremendous opportunity to glorify Jesus in favor of frivolous activities. Second, approaching Easter from the perspective of walking out our faith in a way that honors God means that there's freedom in how we celebrate it. It means we can incorporate some of those fun cultural elements that our kids love without losing sight of the meaning of the holiday, as long as we keep our priorities in order. For Christians, our Easter focus should be on the resurrection of Jesus. It should be on remembering and celebrating that event, telling it to our children, inviting our neighbors and friends to church with us to hear that story, and praising God because He sent His Son, who died for us and was resurrected, defeating sin and death. Now, if we want to then supplement that day of celebration with secondary cultural activities like Easter egg hunts and baskets of candy, I see no problem with that at all. And the reason I say that is because of the next topic we're going to discuss. Those on the more radical end of the spectrum will claim that bunnies and eggs are historically known as symbols of fertility, and therefore they represent a direct link to ancient pagan springtime rituals, and therefore we're dishonoring God by bringing pagan things into Easter. Some will even go so far as to say that incorporating those things into Easter means that we're participating in pagan rituals. And of course, it's true that bunnies and eggs have historically been seen as symbols of fertility, and they can be linked to, to pagan springtime rituals. And, and we'll get into those specific claims shortly. But the reason this whole line of thinking just doesn't hold water is because it conflates the nature and purposes of three things, celebration, worship, and symbols. And it takes a superficial, and in my opinion, a sophomoric view of these issues. So let's spend a couple minutes just teasing them apart and try to gain some clarity before we move on to examining some specific claims. And we'll start with symbols. Now a symbol, of course, is a visual image that represents or stands for a real thing such as a concept or a belief or an action. For example, bunnies and eggs can be symbols of fertility. But the thing we often miss when it comes to symbols is that the meaning of a symbol is actually not located in the symbol itself, but in the person or culture interpreting it. For example, what do you think this symbol means? For most of humanity today, this symbol is highly offensive because it's associated with the atrocities committed by the Nazi regime in World War II. In fact, in some places, just displaying a, a swastika is considered hate speech. But in many ancient cultures around the world, this symbol represented life and power and strength. In fact, the name swastika comes from Sanskrit and it means the mark of well-being. Even today, it's seen as a symbol of good luck or spirituality in Hinduism and Buddhism. So the meaning of a symbol is determined by the culture in which it's used. The, the meaning of a symbol is in the eye of the beholder, so to speak. Now the same is true of symbols associated with Easter today, like bunnies. It's certainly true that in many pagan cultures, rabbits were seen as a symbol of fertility. But in some ancient Christian cultures, they were seen as a symbol of the virgin birth and even the resurrection. For example, in this 500-year-old painting, the white rabbit symbolizes Mary's purity and her virginity. And because female rabbits can conceive a litter of offspring while still pregnant with the first litter, they give the appearance of being able to give birth without having been impregnated. So some Christians saw rabbits as a symbol of the virgin birth. And because they live in tunnels underground, the appearance of baby rabbits out of the ground 
were linked with the resurrected Jesus walking out of his tomb. So my point here is that when it comes to symbols, meaning is in the eye of the beholder. There's not an automatic evil pagan association. In fact, I would argue that when the average American walks down the Easter aisle at Walmart, they don't think to themselves, oh, this must be the springtime pagan ritual aisle celebrating fertility. No, most people merely see the bunnies and chicks and Easter eggs as traditional symbols of the modern holiday called Easter. Therefore, to level a charge of paganism or idolatry against Christians who, who observe Easter is just intellectually dishonest. Idolatry requires willful worship. It's when you approach something knowing that you're doing it as an act of worship. And I don't know anyone who puts out baskets of candy or paints Easter eggs as an act of worship. These cultural activities are just something we do. And that brings us to the ideas of celebration and worship. And the murky waters between these two ideas is where many internet myths are born. The problem arises when we conflate and mix up those two concepts of celebration and worship. Now, there's certainly some overlap, but these ideas have distinct meanings and purposes and implications. So let's briefly break down the differences and apply them to Easter. So celebration is a broad concept that refers to the act of observing a significant event or an occasion with joy and festivity and, and public acknowledgement. Think of a wedding. You're celebrating the joining of a couple in marriage, and there's a ritual or a ceremony, and there's a, the giving of gifts and the sharing of a communal meal and music and dancing and joy, right? But you're not worshiping the couple, and you're not worshiping the institution of marriage. The same is true of birthdays. You're celebrating a friend or a loved one on, on the day they were born with joy and gift giving and all the rest. But you're not worshiping the birthday boy or girl. So the focus of a celebration is on expressing joy and gratitude and fellowship and community. And this can be a very Christian thing to do. Many celebrations fall under the category of loving your neighbor. How beautiful to celebrate the birth or the achievements of the people that God has placed around us. And we're celebrating them, but we're not worshiping them. Celebration can and often is part of the worship of God, but it's not limited to only religious or, or spiritual contexts. People celebrate all kinds of cultural and national and personal and secular events. Now, worship, on the other hand, is something quite different. It's a reverential act, an expression of devotion toward a divine being or a sacred object. And the goal of worship is to honor or praise or, or seek communion with or favor from the object of worship. For Christians, worship is about seeking spiritual connection or guidance from God or, or expressing gratitude to Him. So worship is an act of intention. What we set our hearts and minds on is what we worship. We can't accidentally or inadvertently worship something that we're not even thinking about. So how do we distinguish between celebration and worship? Well, the difference is defined by the focus or the intent of the participants. Celebrations are, are focused on joy and community and shared experiences. Worship, on the other hand, is focused on acknowledging the divine and expressing reverence and devotion. So we can celebrate many things without worshiping them. In fact, Jesus celebrated the Feast of Dedication, which we know today as Hanukkah. He was celebrating a historic event in which the temple in Jerusalem was restored after being defiled. So was Jesus worshiping the temple? No, of course not. He was celebrating something that God did in history. So what about Easter today? Well, I would submit that the purely secular version of Easter with the candy and the Easter egg hunts and all the rest is merely a celebration. It's about community and joy and, and fun for children. Families get together and, and wear pastel clothes and have brunch, right? But people aren't worshiping nature or the cycles of birth or, or a goddess of fertility. People don't honor and praise and express devotion to the Easter Bunny. No, secular Easter is as non-religious as the 4th of July or, or Labor Day. So in my opinion, the biggest danger of the secular version of Easter isn't the, the growth of paganism or accidentally worshiping pagan deities. Its biggest danger is that it pulls our focus away from Jesus and his glorious gospel. 
Now, conversely, the Christian celebration of Easter, or some churches call it Resurrection Sunday, is all about worship. Its focus is on Jesus. It's about reverence and remembering and, and devotion and honor and praise for God for sending his son and raising him from the grave. In the Christian observance of Easter, Holy Scripture is read and, and songs of praise are sung and prayers of faith and gratitude are offered. And Christian Easter is also very evangelical. The gospel is preached to packed churches full of people, many of whom aren't normally there th throughout the year, right? So if you think about it, choosing to commemorate the, the resurrection of our Lord by celebrating Easter is a far better witness to the world and does much more to promote the gospel than choosing to ignore or ban the holiday because of alleged pagan connections. Which brings us to our next topic. One common claim I hear is that Easter is a man-made holiday and therefore shouldn't be observed by Christians. And we have to acknowledge that there is no command in Scripture for us to set aside a day to commemorate the resurrection. It's a man-made holiday that was established by very early believers in Jesus. Which raises the question, why is this a problem? Many of our Torah-keeping friends promote the idea that the only festivals Christians should keep are the seven feasts that Yahweh gave in the Torah. They point out that these are the, the appointed feasts that Jesus kept, and therefore the only feasts that Christ followers should keep. However, that's not what the Bible says. Scripture doesn't say that believers are, are forbidden from keeping man-made holidays that honor the Lord. In fact, as we just saw, the seven Torah feasts aren't the only feasts that Jesus kept. He also celebrated a man-made festival. John 10 says, at that time, the Feast of Dedication took place in Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple in the colonnade of Solomon. So the Feast of Dedication, which we know today as Hanukkah, is a man-made festival. In fact, it celebrates an event that occurred centuries after the Hebrew Bible was completed. The Feast of Dedication commemorates the rededication of the Jewish temple in the, in the Maccabean Revolt against the Seleucid Empire. And in the passage from John 10 that we just looked at, Jesus is in Jerusalem at the temple, walking among his fellow Jews, celebrating that feast. Now, some folks might try to argue that all this passage says is that Jesus was in the temple in Jerusalem during the Feast of Dedication, but it doesn't actually say he celebrated it. And they're, they're trying to defend this false idea that the only holidays Christians should celebrate are the feasts given in the Torah. And there are two big problems with that. First, the Bible nowhere says that the only holidays God's people can celebrate are the Torah feasts. Ironically, that's a, that's a man-made idea. And second, we just read that Jesus was in Jerusalem at the temple teaching his fellow Jews during the Feast of Dedication. Now, why did John include that fact in his gospel? Think about it. If non-Torah feasts were prohibited, wouldn't it be important to John to tell us that despite being in attendance, Jesus wasn't actually celebrating this festival. He was just hanging out with all the other Jews who were keeping it. And if that's the case, why don't we see Jesus rebuking his fellow Jews for celebrating a non-Torah festival? No, this passage clearly tells us that Jesus had no problem with God's people keeping a man-made God-honoring holiday that wasn't commanded in the Torah. And the Christian celebration of Easter is very much a man-made, God-honoring holiday. But that still leaves the question of the pagan roots of Easter. So let's look at those claims next. Maybe the most popular internet myth is that Easter has its roots in Ishtar of ancient Mesopotamia. And there are at least two glaring problems with this claim. First, that claim is based on the superficial similarity between the words Easter and Ishtar. And the problem with making this connection is the fact that the celebration of Christ's resurrection wasn't originally called Easter. In fact, the Feast of the Resurrection started at least six centuries before the English word Easter ever came into existence. Even today, most languages refer to the Easter holiday using some form of the word Pesach which is the Hebrew word for Passover. 
For example, in Italian, Easter is called Pasqua. In French, Le Pac. In Norwegian, Posque. In Spanish, Pasqua. These names sound nothing like Ishtar. And second, and more importantly, the Christian celebration of Easter has literally zero historical connection to Ishtar. Ishtar isn't even a feast or a celebration. She was, she was a goddess of war and love. Ishtar was the, the protector of temple prostitutes and the patroness of the alehouse. So what does a mythical Mesopotamian warrior sex goddess have to do with the resurrection of a real historic Jewish man? The answer, of course, is nothing. There's no religious link between the two. Ancient Mesopotamian religion was polytheistic. They worshiped several primary gods and thousands of lesser gods. This is the antithesis of the monotheism of Christianity. There's also no symbolic connection. Ishtar's symbols weren't eggs and bunnies, but rather the lion and the eight-pointed star. And they're not even of the same type. Ishtar was a goddess, an entity, a deity. Easter is a feast. It's, it's a celebration and a remembrance. So there, there was no ancient Ishtar that evolved into Easter. And lastly, the time frame doesn't line up. Ishtar worship had almost completely died out by 400 BC. And the commemoration of the resurrection of Jesus didn't begin until 500 years later with the early Christian church. So let's just put that silly myth to rest. Other than similar sounding names, Ishtar has nothing to do with Easter. Internet historians and even our, some of our Torah-keeping friends will claim that the English word Easter was derived from Ostre, the Anglo-Saxon goddess of spring and fertility, hence the connection with bunnies and eggs and, as symbols of fertility. However, bunnies and eggs have nothing to do with the Christian story of Easter. In fact, nowhere in scripture are eggs or bunnies used as symbols of anything. More than that, Easter has nothing to do with fertility. It's about resurrection. So the claim about the pagan roots of Easter is actually based on a shallow understanding of both paganism and Christianity. Those two worldviews couldn't be more different. In the pagan worldview, a spring feast was an annual attempt to, to appease the gods or goddesses in the hopes that they would bless the people with an abundant crop in the next season. And that entire enterprise is foreign to the Christian celebration of Easter. E Easter isn't a forward-looking event full of hope for agricultural success or, or blessings from God. It's a remembrance. It's a looking back at the most significant event in human history when God raised his son from the dead. So unlike pagan rites, Christians don't make sacrifices to God in the hope of earning his blessings. In fact, it's just the opposite. At Easter, Christians remember the sacrifice that God made for us. We celebrate the resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth, the eternal Passover lamb who was sacrificed for the sins of the world and three days later was resurrected, defeating both sin and death. And pagans don't observe the Christian holiday of Easter. Why? Because it isn't pagan. And here's the thing. Let's keep some perspective here. Every day of the year belongs to the living God, not to pagans or, or their rituals. Psalm 24 says, The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. So God Almighty doesn't need to tiptoe around what pagans do. If we've placed our faith in Jesus and given him our believing loyalty, we don't need to run around like scared chickens trying to avoid every little pagan thing. It all belongs to God in the first place. The book of 1 Kings tells us that King Solomon used materials and labor from the pagan nations around him to build the Lord's holy temple. And did you know that parts of the Hebrew Bible in the books of Daniel and Ezra were written in Aramaic, not Hebrew? Aramaic is the language of the pagan nation of Aram, also known as Syria. And the late Michael Heiser offered a fantastic example of how pagan themes were incorporated and appropriated into ancient Israelite worship in the Torah. Look at how the Ten Commandments begins. God's talking about having no other gods before him and not engaging in idolatry. Let's read from Exodus 20, starting at verse 3. You shall have no other gods before me. 
You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. Now, these commandments reveal that carved images or, or idols alone aren't the problem. The problem is bowing down to them, serving them, worshiping them. Why do I say that? Well, because just a few chapters later, God commands Israel to make images of heavenly things. God commands them to make images of cherubim and place them on top of the Ark of the Covenant. These are those winged angelic heavenly creatures. And in Exodus 25, God says, and you shall make two cherubim of gold, of hammered work shall you make them, on the two ends of the mercy seat. That's the, the lid of the ark. The cherubim shall spread out their wings above, overshadowing the mercy seat with their wings. Their faces one to another toward the mercy seat shall the faces of the cherubim be. Here's an artist rendering of what that might have looked like. So here we have a graven image of heavenly beings commanded by God and placed on top of the Ark of the Covenant. And then in Exodus 26, God commands the Israelites to make a temple veil with images on it. And you shall make a veil of blue and purple and scarlet yarns and fine twined linen. It shall be made with cherubim skillfully worked into it. So there are those images of heavenly beings again. And guess what? Cherubim are found in ancient Near Eastern pagan iconography. In fact, even the Hebrew word for cherubim, which is keruv, comes from the Akkadian word karivu. And in, in Akkadian literature, the, the karivu symbolized divine presence and protection. And in ancient Near Eastern iconography, they were, they were traditional guardians of sacred spaces. And Yahweh incorporated and, and appropriated this pagan imagery in his tabernacle. And on top of that, the nature and design of the Ark of the Covenant is based on an Egyptian palanquin. They're essentially the same thing and serve the same purpose. The Ark, just like the palanquin, is a wooden box with a lid that contains sacred relics and it features images of protective divine beings watching over it and it was carried around from place to place. Some scholars even suggest that the two cherubim on top of the Ark are essentially Israelite versions of the winged Egyptian goddesses Isis and Nephsis. <laughs> so you've got pagan Mesopotamian iconography reflected in the cherubim, which is an Akkadian term, and you've got the idea of an Egyptian palanquin reflected in the Ark of the Covenant. And God is not only okay with these things, He commanded it that way. How is this possible in light of God's prohibition against idolatry in Exodus 20? Well, it's because the Israelites weren't bowing down to the cherubim. They, they weren't worshiping the Ark of the Covenant. What we worship is what we set our hearts and minds on. Worship requires intent. And those things weren't the object of worship for the Israelites. They were the beautiful cultural ornamentation that surrounded the worship of the God of Israel. And God took those pagan elements, which were religious symbols in, in the wider culture in which the Israelites lived, and he pointed them toward himself. He refashioned them into sacred objects used in the worship of Yahweh. And in the same way, Christians today can safely appropriate the cultural or ornamentation of Easter baskets and, and painted eggs in our observance of the holiday of Easter, because we aren't bowing down to these things or worshiping them. And by the way, the same is true of, the same is true of trees and, and wreaths during Christmas, right? These aren't objects of worship. They're, they're cultural decorations. And God can use anything to bring glory to himself. So it's, it's not about names or, or baskets of candy or bunnies or other things. It's about our hearts. What we set our hearts and minds on is what we worship. And on Easter, Christians celebrate and worship Jesus. In Hebrew root circles, the Roman Emperor Constantine is often viewed as the boogeyman of ancient Christianity. 
Conspiracy theorists point to the Council of Nicaea that he convened in 325 AD as a source of corruption. And while they make plenty of false claims about Nicaea, they aren't entirely off base when it comes to that council and the celebration of Easter. At the time of the council, some Christians were celebrating Easter on the Sunday following the Paschal full moon, while others celebrated it on 14 Nisan, which is the Hebrew date that God gave to Israel for keeping the Passover. Now, while the council didn't determine the specific date on which church should observe Easter, it did declare that all Christians should observe it on the same day, and further, that it should be a Sunday, the day that the Lord rose from the grave. So for the sake of church-wide uniformity, the council was promoting independence from the Jewish calendar. Now, Constantine wrote a letter to those not at the council to let them know about the Easter decision. And in this letter, he takes offense at the religious Jews who were denying Christ. And sadly, he goes beyond a, a mere theological disagreement into a disparaging personal opinion of the Jews as a people. And those negative comments were damaging and, and contributed to a shameful rise in anti-Jewish sentiment in the church over the following centuries. And while we can and should reject Constantine's anti-Semitic remarks and attitude as wrong and unchristlike, there was nothing wrong or unbiblical with the council's decision about the date of Easter. Because first, there's no date in scripture on which we are commanded to celebrate it. And second, we have to acknowledge that Easter is not Passover. One celebrates the deliverance of ancient Israel, the other commemorates the resurrection of Christ. So while Passover contains a powerful foreshadowing of the sacrifice and death of Christ, it doesn't speak to his resurrection. Now, don't get me wrong, it's no coincidence that Jesus celebrated his Last Supper as a Passover Seder, and his death and resurrection occurred during the very Pesach holiday that had been foreshadowing his suffering for almost 1,500 years. But Passover isn't Easter. And so, because the early Christians felt it important to commemorate the resurrection of Jesus, and we can certainly understand why, they really only had two choices for doing so. So on one hand, they could have opted to change the nature of Passover as commanded in the Torah and expand it to include a celebration of the resurrection as well. And in that case, 14 Nisan would be the date for celebrating it. And I'll be honest, that, that, that option makes a lot of sense to me. The only downside is that it disconnects the celebration of the resurrection from the day of the week on which God raised Jesus because 14 Nisan falls on a different day of the week every year. This year it's on a Monday, I think. On the other hand, the early church could have chosen to do what they did and separate the celebration of the resurrection from the observance of Passover. And while some may protest celebrating Easter on any date other than 14 Nisan, the council's decision was neither unbiblical nor illogical. In the end, Scripture doesn't require a celebration of the resurrection, so being dogmatic on the date of Easter doesn't seem wise or profitable to me. The particular date of observance is far eclipsed by the importance of the event being celebrated. Our focus this time of year should be on the victorious work of Christ, our Messiah, who walked out of his grave that historic Sunday morning, defeating sin and death and reconciling mankind to God. There's another puzzling allegation of corruption popular in Torahism, or Hebrew roots. And I'll be honest, I cannot figure out what they're trying to prove. But the claim is widespread enough that it needs to be addressed. So, some of our Torah-keeping Christian friends see a, a deceptive miscalculation regarding the amount of time that Jesus spent in the grave. They'll point to Matthew 12, where the Pharisees and teachers of the law asked him for a sign, uh, Matthew 12, verses 39 and 40 say, He answered, A wicked and adulterous generation asks for a sign, but none will be given it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So the claim is this. When asked for proof that he was the Messiah, Jesus gave just one sign. He would be in the grave for three days and three nights. However, if Jesus died and was buried on a Friday and rose on a Sunday, as Roman corrupted theology teaches, 
He was only in the grave for two days and two nights. And our Torah-keeping friends cry foul and, and argue that something doesn't add up. They explain that we need to view this issue of three days from a Hebrew perspective. And, and remember that the Jewish day starts at sundown. So they, they work out the math from there and, and calculate that Jesus was actually crucified on Wednesday afternoon. That way, when Mary went to the tomb on the first day of the week, we now have the three days and three nights that Jesus predicted. So the first thing that comes to mind when I hear this theory is, what's your point? Suppose Jesus was actually crucified on a Wednesday. What does that then prove? Sunday would still be Easter, right? But let's indulge this theory and see how we can reconcile this apparent discrepancy between the number of days Jesus predicted and the actual amount of days he spent in the grave. Well, it turns out this is actually not a math problem, but a language problem. In the New Testament, several phrases are used interchangeably to refer to the third day. For example, in Matthew 27, we read, starting at verse 62, The next day, the one after preparation day, the chief priests and the Pharisees went to Pilate. Sir, they said, we remember that while he was still alive, that deceiver said, After three days, I will rise again. So, give the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. So the Jewish leaders used the phrase after three days and until the third day in synonymously, which shows they understood them to mean the same thing. Jesus understood them that way as well. Look at the different ways that he worded his own predictions about rising from the grave. In Matthew 17, he says, The Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him, and he will be raised on the third day. In John 2, he says, Destroy this temple, speaking of his body, and in three days I will raise it up. And Mark 8 says, And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and, after three days, rise again. So Jesus himself used various phrases synonymously to describe the same length of time, three days and three nights, on the third day, in three days, after three days. And the New Testament writers used a similar variety of phrases to refer to his resurrection. So what's the best explanation of these discrepancies? Were, were Jesus and the New Testament writers confused? <laughs> of course not. In the first century Near East, these expressions were all idioms that could be used interchangeably to refer to the same amount of time. In the case of Christ's resurrection, these phrases refer to what we would call today the third day. So why do I say the third day is the ultimate time frame that they were talking about? Well, for that, we can look to the episode of the resurrected Jesus appearing to the two men on the road to Emmaus. Luke 24 records this interaction. So on the same day that the tomb was discovered empty, Jesus appeared alongside a man named Cleopas and his friend and asked him what they were talking about. Picking up at Luke 24, verse 19. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped he was the one that was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. So Jesus was crucified on Friday, the first day. He spent the second day, which was a Sabbath, in the grave. And on the third day, Sunday, God raised him from the dead, which brings us to the final claim we want to examine. Another common claim is that Jesus rose from the dead on the Sabbath, but his tomb wasn't discovered empty until the next day. Our Torah-keeping friends who believe this will often appeal to God's sacred appointed times. And, and they're right that the tomb was found empty on the first day of the week. All four Gospels confirm this. The Bible clearly indicates that the tomb was discovered empty after Shabbat, early on a Sunday morning. But does it offer any reason to think that Jesus had actually been raised from the dead the previous day? No. It says nothing about that. In fact, if Jesus rose on Shabbat, but wasn't discovered until the next day, think about the confusion that would create. For example, Jesus told his disciples, the Son of Man must suffer many things and on the third day be raised. 
And again in Luke 24, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead. And Peter said in Acts 10.40, God raised him on the third day and made him to appear. And Paul wrote, He was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. Jesus and the apostles spoke of His being raised on the third day. They didn't, they didn't say that His disciples would learn that He had risen on the third day. So if He was actually raised on Shabbat and that was the third day, well then His followers didn't learn of it until the fourth day. And the New Testament says nothing about a fourth day. Our Hebrew Roots friends are very adamant about God's appointed times in the Torah, and I'm certainly not denying that importance. But they seem to miss that God also appointed times in the New Testament. It's no accident that Yahweh chose to raise Jesus from the dead on the first day of the week, not the Sabbath. Jesus spent Shabbat in the grave. His resurrection then was symbolic of a new creation. And 50 days later at Pentecost, God appointed His Holy Spirit to fall on the new church on the first day of the week as well, not on the Sabbath. So it's no wonder that the early Christian church came to refer to the first day of the week as the Lord's Day. Mm. Yes, Easter is a man-made rather than biblically mandated holiday. But there's nothing wrong with man-made remembrances of God moving among His people. Even Jesus celebrated the man-made Feast of Dedication. Historically speaking, the motivation for the Christian holiday of Easter was the commemoration of the work of Christ, not pagan gods or rituals. And on Easter, Christians aren't worshiping nature or the earth or the Easter bunny. We're worshiping Jesus. So we can join the Apostle Peter in saying, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Happy Easter. He is risen.